exciting in anticipation because we have some extremely promising and talented young authors here who are going to um, take on the arduous and daunting task of commenting on how they are furthering Pakistani English fiction um, you know and how the submarine is going to torpedo things but uh, let me just go ahead and introduce them there is on my left um, I was just going to say Tania Kehar, but it's <laughs> Taha Kehar, <laughs> author of the typically Tania and other things, a uh, graduate of SOAS, and um, the Bichara, the only male in the bunch. So, you know, be nice, be nice. <laughs> and then we have um, <coughs> Safina Danishalahi, uh, Mrs. Danishalahi, <laughs> and she is um, a lawyer, which is scary because I'm married to one too, so I sympathize with her husband. <laughs> and then she has two kids, and I do too, and I sympathize <laughs> there. And in spite of all this, she finds a great deal of time to um, pursue her art and fiction. And then, of course, we have the famous Meera Sethi. <laughs> will you kill me if I say Ali Sethi's sister? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will. Okay, so I won't say she's Ali Sethi's sister. I'll get to that later. But uh, Meera is a notable actress and journalist and, uh, well, I think a finger in every creative pie we can think of, right? And in including fiction as well. Um, but, uh, and it's very rare to be that versatile and that multi-talented. So um, that really is incredible. And so um, I'm just going to, we also have um, <coughs> right there. Now, I hope you can see her. Yes, you can. Um, we have Sarvath, um, I see in joining us from the United Kingdom. And um, I don't know why she's looking so glum. Smile, smile, smile. <laughs> right. And it's going to be chill. It's going to be chill, I promise. And uh, she is um, a sort of, you know, also a notable author and a very sensitive writer. She's, for some reason, this Orpheus and Eurydice thing that I'm going to talk to her about is uh, stuck in my mind in that she's based one of her, her works on the myth. Um, and uh, we're going to get to that, but um, so, you know, a number of these people are incredibly qualified with degrees from Oxford and so as and Patani Kya Kya and so on and so forth. But, um, but don't hold that against them. I think that they can all be <laughs> extremely pleasant and down to earth. So let's begin. All right. <clears throat> so let's attack the male in the room. Um, Taha, uh, I have read typically Tanya, and while I don't want to reveal much of the plot because I am a reviewer who doesn't care to do that in you know publicly, um, I do find the character, the madcap character of Tanya, to be extremely um, authentic, and it's not easy for males uh, to write women and and vice versa, mm -hmm. and yet you managed it, you know, and you did it pretty uh, pretty well. Um, and I don't think it was a tukka. Now, is, does that come from personal experience? Does that come from observation, your reading? Uh, or did your sister beat you up so much that you just ended up getting a great insight into character? I do have a sister, but she never beat me up. <laughs> um, we're talking about candid narratives here, and I think when we speak about candor, we do need to recognize the question of authenticity. Uh, it's very difficult to, as you rightly pointed out, talk from a man's perspective about a woman and vice versa, even when women write men. I think women get them right usually. No, actually they get them completely wrong. Really? I have yet to read a female author who's gotten the man completely That's correct. That's fascinating because yeah. I always find that spot on. <laughs> Oddly enough, I was accused of making the men very stereotypically um, pompous, vain, and the women were What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> it's the white chromosome it club. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it does stem from observation. It stems from a deep sensitivity over the plight that women encounter. Um, I was working as a journalist at the time, and I had a lot of female journalist friends who went through many of the experiences that I documented in the novel. 
and it was very important for them to read what I had written. So I did have an unofficial panel of female journalists who read the Input. book. Input. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It, was, it was essential because there were times when um, throughout the novel, without giving too much away, Tanya doesn't weep. Tanya doesn't cry. So there was this one point when she had a tear in her eye and someone pointed out it's not necessary for her to cry. If she didn't cry when that big thing happened, why is she crying over this very small aspect of life? And I said, okay, that's fascinating. So you do need to have those checks and balances in place. You have right. your observations, you have your sensitivity over things, but you also need uh, fact checking, you need mm -hmm. someone to say nay. And you need to also have some <coughs> grip over the ethical considerations because uh, typically Tanya was written from the first person narrative perspective. Are you going to go ahead and write, um, you know, counter this argument that you can't get the men right and that they're stereotypical by getting the men right in the future, whatever that means? I do want to. I want to write I didn't about. I find them stereotypical, but then I'm a generous reviewer <laughs> and not everybody is as generous, so. Um, <coughs> I do intend to write a novel with just two men mm. and no women. I, I think that would be very unexciting. because Is I that projected? I mean, is that what you're planning? I'm planning that. Right. And so uh, could you tell us a little bit more without actually revealing too it much? It hasn't been written yet because hmm. I feel like I gravitate towards the female characters. But it's characters. in your head. Yeah. I gravitate towards the female characters more. But the male characters is what I'm very curious and I'm doing a lot of research on that these mm -hmm. days. So um, I do intend to do that without giving too much away. Okay, go on. Um, Mrs. Elahi, uh, the thing is that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious, um, disrespectful. And I said that deliberately because you are a mother, you are a wife, you are a, I don't know why you're a lawyer, okay? <laughs> what sort of law is it, please? Um, I, I'm not practicing, so But, it, but you, if you were I studied, one. Yeah. Studied the law, would I, would, I would have done corporate, that's oh. where I practiced. All right. Um, the thing is, well, good thing you didn't. Um, <laughs> but all jokes aside, um, you know, given all that, what led you towards narratives, candid or not? Um, uh, you know, what, what was, you know, who was your muse? Mm -hmm. um, so when I, I also write poetry. Mm -hmm. and I wrote That's the why novel, I used yeah. to muse, yeah. So, and then I did the novel mm -hmm. Eye on the Prize, and, uh, which basically deals uh, with modern day parenting. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that in fiction, um, not many stories were being told, which were somehow ordinary, but special in their own way. Mm -hmm. Being a mother, mm -hmm. and I've taught also, so I've been a teacher as well. Yeah. And I've Education. interacted with some, you know, maybe two, three hundred parents. And <coughs> all of them seem to be in this race to, you know, social climb or get their child to be the first in everything. And I just wanted to talk about the pressures today felt by parents mm. um, to just be on top of everything. I mean, I think it's okay to just, you know, take a step back sometimes and not be everything and not be the best of everything. So, you know, in my, um, uh, in my shoes, I just tried to portray a story. And currently what I'm, you know, a, a book that I'm writing right now, I've just, you know, signed with a publisher. That is also a very simple story. Um, it, it has harassment, it has classism, but it's about ordinary people. It's about a brother and a sister, and it, it's about, you know, their house help. So <coughs> just my take was to introduce ordinary stories in the landscape of fiction in Pakistan. There might be some aspiring writers here and, you know, there might be friends of aspiring writers here. Um, you have to obviously set aside uh, your day-to-day -day considerations in order to give time to your craft and your talent. Um, I remember H.M. Nakhmi making a very wise statement at one point, which was that writing is a very lonely profession. Mm -hmm. You kind of, you, you know, it's just you and your words mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, the thing is that for you, just taking a break to sit about when the children were young, just to have a shower or cook or something <laughs> was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you obviously have to carve out that private space and then work. And what are some of the challenges that you faced and what are some of the joys? Let us know. Um, I think uh, 
Uh, when you say private space, I don't <laughs> think I've had any private no, space. Oh, I <laughs> Oh, God, God. So even while I was writing and editing. We must get you some private <laughs> space. <laughs> they, you know, so my, I think my daughter was eight when I wrote the first novel. Mm-hmm. Son was two, maybe three. And uh, they wow. would think that I'm playing a game on the laptop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they'd just be like, mama, 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 mama. And I'm like, can I just, can I just finish this sentence? You know, can I just, can I just like put down this wow. thought before I answer what, what you have to say? You right. know, and it would be obviously something very, you know, minimal. Mm. Um, and uh, mm. wouldn't say unimportant because it was, you know, hugely important to them. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, a, a writer is kind of chaotic in their minds as well. So... All that chaos also reveals some kind of creative process. Right. <laughs> Speaking of chaos, Meera, how <laughs> is it that you managed to do so many things so well? Are you a Virgo? I'm not. My mother is. <laughs> okay. Well, you were raised by a Virgo. <laughs> Important enough. Um, but the thing is, so many things so very well. And, um, and still maintained your, you know, sort of sense of balance and proportion and, um, you know, sort of sang fraud throughout that. Um, you know, what's your secret? And speaking of mother, of course, you know, you come from famous parents, uh, hardworking, um, uh, hardworking people as well as um, very well-known people. And I'm sure that your brother, mm, you know, sort of puts a great deal into his um, uh, profession and uh, so on. Um, I'm sure you're both equally proud of each other. But so how, how have, what is your secret? Uh, if you well, may, if you want to reveal well it. That thank is. you for your kind words. <laughs> but uh, assalamu alaikum everyone. <laughs> I am uh, so happy to be here. Um, I'll just get to your uh, question in a second. <laughs> I have my book came out in um, April of last year. So no have been I've uh, been speaking all over not the world, but the US, and I was recently in Dubai. And this is my first event in Pakistan, so I'm very, very happy that you all are Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for coming to see all of us here. Hi, Sarvat. I, don't, I think you're he- he- tuned in from London, so hello to you too. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I don't have a secret. My husband is here. This is the first uh, time he's come to one of my events because it's in Pakistan for the first time, and he will tell you, I am a nut job. I am chaotic. I am things, words I don't want to utter here uh, because this is a very respectful um, and very dignified audience. So there is no secret at all, jack of all trades. So I won't say to you because I write and I do my own work. So those are, I think, both forms of storytelling. Uh, those are both narrative driven. Um, I love narratives. Um, Zadie Smith, for those of you who might like to read literature, once said, Uh, in a collection of essays, she said that, you know, most people think that the creative arts are very creative. It's called creative writing. And she said, that's not true. Actually, a a flower, the bulb of a little tulip becoming a flower is an act of creation. But writing is an act of supreme control. And I think that there is a lot of chaos as well, as Safina said, I Mm -hmm. totally agree with that. But there's a lot of control. You get to write the beginning, the middle, and the end. You are the author of what you create. And so I think that, um, I think there's a lot of that as Bilal, well. Bilal, she doesn't sound like a nut job to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record. You should have Bilal <laughs> sit here, actually. <laughs> we were contemplating that a little earlier in case you were ambushed and didn't come. Um, <clears throat> What, what, what do you feel about the future of literature in Pakistan and your position when it comes to it, etc.? The future of literature in Pakistan, I don't know how much time we have. Um, it's look, at, look at all the people here. I think it's very hopeful. Um, I think that one of the things I experienced in writing this book was that I wanted to tell very local uh, stories. And... Um, I think I have told very local stories. I don't know how many of you have read Are You Enjoying? But one of the difficulties that an author from, say, a non-Western country like Pakistan faces is you have to sort of ask yourself a question early on in your career, which is, above all, do I want to be accessible to the West? Above all, do I want to be understood by the West? And above all, do I want to be a bridge maker? These are very important questions. And to sit right. here today and pretend like, no, no, I'm not I've been published in the US and in Britain as well. 
uh, would be a lie. So I think there is a desire to explain our part of the world to the West. I think that the Pakistan that often goes out is the Pakistan we hear about in he headlines of newspapers, which is, you know, bombings But I really wanted to talk about Pakistan with a lowercase p. How do we live and love in Pakistan? What are the ways in which we have secrets and what are the ways in which we navigate identity in a country where so much of our lives, so much of our lives are is surveilled, right? Um, are you enjoying is, is man, in many ways a book of secrets. It's about how people improvise identities as they go along. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I think that No, no, we have time. I mean, yeah. forget the future of uh, um, um, Pakistani literature. We, we don't have all that, uh, in that, uh, that yeah. much, but we have about 45 minutes more. So go on, uh, expand on what you want. I thank you. I think mm -hmm. that um, I think that Safina here is a publisher, and I greatly admire her because she's publishing uh, English language fiction with a local imprint. And I think that that is actually incredible. Um, and that is how you nurture talent. That is one of the ways. Uh, my sister-in-law is sitting in the audience. She's also working on a novel. And she's been working on it for a very long time. And I hope that she c finishes it and continues it. And avenues like these, like the KLF, where you nurture and bring people together, I think are very, very important. So your wife and sister are both novelists. Well, I'm feeling very sorry for you, sir. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, let's get to Sarvath, who's been very patient, yeah. and she's there on Zoom. Are we audible to you, uh, Sarvath? Can't really hear we her. We can't hear her. In inki awaz zara amplify kijiye. But can you hear us? Okay, good. Well, let me begin, and then hopefully by the time you answer, then they'll amplify it. So I was fascinated by the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, and um, so. I was reminded of William Congreve, who was an Augustan poet of the 18th century. And uh, he was one of Dryden's circle. So he wrote, um, the the, it's in the Metamorphoses, that's where you get Orpheus and Eurydice. And for the audience, this was the, a great musician who, uh, in Greek mythology, who lost his wife when she was very young. So he went to the underworld to get her back. And if you were living, you couldn't go to the underworld. But his music was so beautiful that he was allowed to go all the way down. And then um, the uh, god and goddess of the underworld allowed him to bring her back uh, on one condition. He should not turn around until he was out in the daylight and look at her. But of course, he turned around. And, you know, that was it. He lost her for many years again. It's very sad. William Congreve um, writes of Orpheus, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you should look him up, given how closely you are affiliated with the myth in that, that book of yours, which I, will now, uh, which I will want you to speak on, and hopefully they can get the volume going. Um, Long are my loss endeavored to sustain, and strongly strove, but strove, alas, in vain. Now by the horrors that these realms surround, by the vast chaos of these depths profound, by the sad silence which eternal reigns through all the waste of these wild ravaged plains, let me again Eurydice receive, let fate her quick spun web of life reweave. Thus while the bard melodiously complains and to his lyre accords his vocal strains, the very bloodless shades attention keep and silent seem compassionate to weep. Then first is said by sacred verse subdued, the furies felt their cheeks with tears bedewed. The furies never wept, and they did. Um, so given your education at Oxford and otherwise, and your love of literature and English and so on and so forth, and narratives, candid and otherwise, what was it that inspired you? Tell us more about this work. Maximize Kari and Ki volume, please, audience. Hello? Is that better? Yeah, we can hear you now. <coughs> oh, good. Um, thank you for that explanation of the myth. That was really beautiful. Um, yeah, it's a story that's been in my head for a really long time. So I've been working on this novel about the myth for about seven years. Yeah. 
story about the men from the parlor. And you know, they're all writers in, in your life that you will write something that will connect with people and that people will love. But for me, I think for me it was the most immediate way in which people connect with something that is artistic because we carry music in our head for so much longer. Like I, you know, I've read lots of wonderful novels in the last couple of years and I think about them after I read them and I think about the story and the characters, but there's nothing there's nothing like the intimacy of when I discover a new musician and I listen to their music again and again and their lyrics and the different sort of like beats and everything just stay in my head complete as they are. There's no distortion between what I'm experiencing and what they've written. It's 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 like a very, very intimate relationship between a musician and a fan. Um, because it can feel like a sinking scoop for people. And that's why people go to concerts and that's why people um, you know, connect to music and about so much. So I wanted to write a book that was both a love story and about the power of music and the power of um, that particular art form. So the book is told through the two perspectives. It's told through the perspective of Ida, who's a rock star, she's a Indian American rock star, and um, Edna, who is her um, lover, and also who is Horace, who's her fan. So that's the third character in the book are these people who are obsessed with her and who think they know her even though they've never met her. And that's its own kind of love story of how you feel like a musician belongs to you. And I think that's particularly true if you're, you know, if you're a, if you're a British person, you know, an American person, you know, anything like that, you can feel a really strong sense of connection with, like, South Asian mm-hmm. musicians. Of person, like, I love Uri Del Park, who I don't know if you guys know, but mm-hmm. is a Pakistani musician who has got a lot of success recently and has been touring around the world and things like that. And I am so excited. I'm going to go see her play in London in a few months. Mm. And I'm more excited about that because I feel like this connection that we have, we both think I'm fun and you, she belongs to me in a very specific way. Mm-hmm. And I think we've always had that with um, South Asian musicians. You know, people felt that way about Jan Monik and lots of people were tweeting about his sisters and things like that. And, you know, before that with Freddie Mercury, you know, only mm-hmm. South Asian people musically have been artists. Mm-hmm. And we knew that because we thought that that could be the South Asian gate that he was out of. Um, so I really wanted to explore that in this book. Well, speaking of music, there's that great scene in Amadeus, which is the film about Mozart, where um, his wife takes some copies of his, uh, uh, some, well, not the, his scores, not copies, to Solieri and says, um, you know, don't look at the work, do you like it? And he says, leave these with me and I'll, I'll, I'll get them back to you. She says, no, no, I can't do that. He doesn't make copies. It comes straight from the, when well, he was a genius, straight from the head to the page, okay? Um, that was Mozart, and I'm sure that, the, that other musicians operate differently. <coughs> um, what, I, what I want uh, to ask you now is whether, you know, some, how do you write? Is it largely just a flow, or do you have to work and rework it? Because I think that this mm-hmm. varies from author to author to author. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, then you get the final product. But what do you have to personally say about that? Because um, I-, I suppose this is the way it is with music too. But musicians often say, no, the, 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 the entire thing was in our head and then we mm-hmm. kind of went, went ahead and put it down and then refined it a little bit and so on. Writing, I think, a little more challenging. Um, so could you comment on that in terms of your own craft? Snapshots of these 
people's lives. And you can break it very quickly and it exists as an object that you can rework it and make that journey happen quicker. But with a novel, for me, it often happens much more slowly. And in this novel, because there's so many different voices, there's the voice of the two lovers, there's the voice of the chorus, and there's different things happening. And mm-hmm. it's set in many different locations. So it starts in London, but it moves. Okay, thanks so much. Let's go this way now. Okay, um, so Mira, would you like to comment on like, wait, you said, you know, you're chaotic and so on, but in terms of your writing, mm. um, do you work and rework it? And this ties into this quen- question of candid narratives, because how candid is a narrative that has been reworked and redone so many times that you've got Botox on it, <laughs> um, uh, you know, to the point where it's uh, no longer particularly natural. And then there's, of course, natural writing, which my students engage in, which is awful uh, sometimes. And Tazeen um, Iram sitting right there, my colleague, will <laughs> testify to this. We teach English at the IBA. But the thing is that, um, so yeah, in ter- please speak uh, in terms sure. of your personal writing, and then also just in terms of general, you know, candid narratives. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I sort of work backwards. I don't think in order to write. I write so that I may know what it is that I'm thinking. The writing is what leads to the thought. Um, and it's very chaotic. And you know, I'm, if you read some of my early drafts, you will probably be scandalized because they're terrible. It's like a big vomit. And then you have to clean it up, and you have to just clean it up for days and months. And honestly, I make this Oh, just Bilal clean it up. I don't say this because you know, you're all here, but here. Like, I have worked on a single short story for probably a year or two years. I've written 50 drafts of a short story. Mm-hmm. Because so much of the drama happens in your subconscious, and you don't even know it. Uh, so it's a slow sort of dredging up your, your, your own subconscious and coming to terms with what the submerged thematic energy of a piece is. And I think short stories are particularly um, kind of really fun in this way because every piece has a submerged thematic energy. Mm. And it's only towards the end, when you get to the end, that you can you sort of realize, oh, this is what it was all about all along. And then if you write a kind of climactic ending or a surprising ending, it can then reconfigure your understanding of what came before. Um, so yeah, it's... it's. Do your so family and in-laws critique your work? Yes, so my uh, mm-hmm. sister-in-law, she's actually mm-hmm. Bilal's first cousin, she read some of the early drafts of Are You Enjoying? Mm-hmm. And um, Bilal as well, he read right. a lot of the early and drafts. How, and uh, uh, and uh, and that I would be I very interesting, to, yeah, inter- uh, very interesting in terms of their input because they are not writers, I, uh, but she is. She is, Akhya but is. he isn't. Yes, um, and he's he's a structural thinker, and I am a free right, association right. space. Yeah, yeah, go on. So tell us more about that yeah. in terms of you know, uh, does he bring out the candid in your narrative? Well, he too wants me to be very bold. He says, Jitna bold hona hai hoja, which hmm. is amazing, which is why I married him. You know, there's um, a quote <laughs> in Edmund Spencer, be bold, be bold, be not too bold. <laughs> <laughs> good for Pakistan, I think. That's very good <laughs> advice. Um, but yes, I don't know. So I don't know if you got around to actually finishing the book, and I don't expect any of you to have actually read it. But kafi, OK, so kafi bold yes, kahaniya has, 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 actually. You, you so have, wrong. OK. So they are actually quite candid, and if you're using candid euphemistically, 
they're actually quite bold. They're about love and lust and how people get around the rules to live the lives that they want to live when they feel watched by people, they feel policed by people. And my characters are constantly kind of straining against the, the sort of straitjacket that society has imposed on them. So they have their journeys of trying to live their most authentic lives. And, and that was what I am really interested in as well. Safina, let's be candid. <laughs> what did you think of Mira's book? Yes. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Ah, I batao, actually can really, you just expound I really on that? I enjoyed the book and I liked hmm. the fact that she took little moments out of people's lives. And I think that's how a short story works hmm. really well. Right. That, you know, like she said, behind closed doors, what's happening? Hmm. And as a writer, um, like Mira also mentioned, that when I was writing, I felt that I policed myself so much mm. because, you know, firstly, I'd be like my father sitting at the <laughs> in the audience <laughs> would be reading it. <laughs> He's, uh, my husband, mother, children all are here today. Oh, mashallah, very nice. So the entire family uh, will be reading mm. it. And then, you know, there are some scenes that when you're writing them, you're not really yourself. You are the character. Right. And you have to make sure that you're doing justice to the character. Mm. Um, and what they're doing, what they're feeling is not necessarily what the reader should be okay with. Right, you know? of course. Um, is that it in um, their comfort zone to read this? So as a writer yeah. in Pakistan, I feel that, you know, that just mm. sort of chains you a little bit. Yeah, that I think, given my training as an academic, um, that's like Keats's concept of intense empathy, negative capability, you yeah. become something so that then your own self is effaced and you are that. Um, and that's how, that was the rationale bit be behind the magnificent Ode to a Nightingale, relax everybody, I'm not going to recite it all right now, although I can from memory if I have to. Um, you though, uh, and I t that ties in, you're a poet on some fronts. Poets find it easier to do this, okay? In fact, necessary to do this. And I think Sarvath would uh, also agree in terms of like the musical aspect of things. But with poetry, um, you can't fake anything. <laughs> you know, it'll fall flat on its face. And so I want you to comment a bit more on that branch of art and your position in it. No, mm -hmm. definitely. So when I um, uh, compiled my collection of poetry, mm -hmm. it's called The Unbridled Romance of Love and Pain. Mm -hmm. and it talks mm -hmm. up about a lot of pain. Mm. So um, when our friends and family read it, they, mm. you know, spoke to my husband and they said, "What have you been doing?" To her? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that yeah, he better be getting this more ibuprofen. Be a recurring theme yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, more <laughs> ibuprofen required, uh, Tylenol. And I said, you know, uh -huh. you actually end up um, being hurt by people you care about the most. Right. And um, doesn't have to be only romantic relationships. It right. could be, you know a sibling, a parent, mm -hmm. a child, a This friend. is not very nice to say this in front of your family, <laughs> by the way. Let's uh, show a little decorum and I respect mean, I mean, here. Everybody <laughs> has been hurt at some point in their lives by someone they love. And um, poetry just uh, takes few words out of your life and mm -hmm. you just compile it in a way that sort of string the chords of your heart. Right. What about that sort of poetry that has nothing to do with love? Just depth of emotion in terms of politics or violence or other stuff. Um, I, I'm not saying you are compelled <laughs> to write that, but um, it's the, then it's really passion, isn't it? it, it that it drives it. Any kind of passion it hmm. can be. You know, D.H. Lawrence was a very unrestrainedly passionate poet um, as such. So yeah, go on. So whatever you're passionate about, if mm. you are passionate about the affairs of your country, right. that is how you're going to put down your word. Mm -hmm. And that is how it's going to affect the people reading it. Okay. Um, your passion is translated you know, into the written word. Right. So speaking of the affairs of the country, sir, <laughs> 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 um, would you like to comment on, no, honestly, would you like to comment on Pakistan um, just the country in general in terms of where literature is headed, how you've seen it headed, what you think instinctively about it. I, on a more macro level, could you speak more than just I think it's on a very level. dynamic scale that things are improving. Mm -hmm. Things have actually got a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, with Safina Publishing in particular recently, we have a diverse menu of new novels coming out. Um, 
from what I can tell, there isn't just an emphasis on literary fiction. I see more experimentation with genre, which is something that didn't exist mm -hmm. before. Mira's book is very different mm -hmm. from the kind of fiction that was published 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. right. And that is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. Safina's book, I don't think anyone has done a book on parenting, have they? Mm. I don't uh, not to my knowledge, actually, and I've read quite a bit. <coughs> so th th that's the thing. I suppose it's almost like you're stretching that elastic, trying to take it as far as you can. Mm -hmm. And it's not going back. It's <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> right. I don't think it's uh, scientifically possible, but I think it's, it's moving in a positive direction, mm -hmm. which is a positive sign. Yeah. Let me go ahead and throw this question out to all four of you. How do you differ from the people who are immediately above you in terms of your, the generation of writers, Kamla, Nakwi, you know, Uzma Salam, whom I'm going to be um, uh, sort of the panelist, uh, the moderator for tomorrow. And then the ones above them, um, uh, you know, sort of even more senior ones. I'm not saying that you're all a bunch of little kids, um, <laughs> although it, for your parents you probably are. But the thing is that um, there is this generational thing, there's this hierarchical, um, uh, there's always been hierarchy in Pakistani mm -hmm. literature and in Pakistani academia and that sort of thing. But, you know, how do you view yourself related to them? And it, I'd like opinions from all four of you on this, um, because that really does fit into Pakistani fiction on a, on a general level. <coughs> I suppose the canon exists and we're just contributing to it in some way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that there is a generational gap because a very dear friend of mine is from the previous generation of, mm -hmm. of Pakistani writers and we seem to get along, we seem to read each Ooh. other's work. Amir Hussain. Oh, Amir oh, Hussain, wow. yeah, yeah. He's oh, a brilliant short oh, story writer. Yeah, yeah, no, Amir yeah, is, is superb, but also very youthful spirited. Very youthful um, spirited. I think, uh, timeless is, yeah. in some timeless ways. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a word for him. But I do feel that with time, things are evolving. Mm -hmm. The way we write is very different from the way they write. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there is something of a generation <laughs> gap, maybe, mm -hmm. I would say, in terms of, in maybe thematically, I would say. No. Uh, especially if you're writing in a very contemporary way, which all of us, I suppose, are yeah. doing. Right. Maybe there will be some kind of a disconnect, but mm -hmm. I don't think well, maybe a disconnect from them, but you you certainly have your own audiences to think about. Exactly, you exactly. See? Totally. And the milieu you're currently mm -hmm. in. And, and yeah. I actually would agree with that. I think that themes are universal. So whether if you're writing about love or violence, it's, you know, it's, it's going to stay the same. But I do think, for example, you know, in the generation above us with Kamala and Mohsin Hamid and all, mm. I think after 9-11, um, these are people who were also published by the West. I think there was a demand to know the inside story from Pakistan. Um, you know, they wanted to know the story about is Islam. They wanted to know about jihad. I don't burrow inside the mind of a jihadist, so I didn't write about that. But I think after 9-11, for about 10 years, there was a little bit of a cottage industry of people, writers from South Asia, um, being asked to explain Islam and explain, right. you know, well, terrorism. Umar, Umar Shahid Hamid did in the Spinner's Tale burrow into the mind right. of a terrorist. And, and Kamala um, also in Home Fire, which I love, I think it's my favorite yeah. book of hers, she also touches upon terrorism. Mm. Um, so I think thoda sa shayad ho, but you know, you, can, you basically can write about anything and I don't think right. there's a huge, uh, it's about what the market demands and the market demands change, but yeah. that's never been my, uh, I don't think of those things when I write. Okay, uh, uh, Sarvat? Uh, sorry. Oh, no, I just want, you know, I wanted uh, Sarvat to go ahead and uh, speak because it had been a while and I don't want her feet to feel like a stepchild sitting <laughs> out there in the UK. Um, would you like to no, comment? I was with you. <laughs> we, 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 we wish we were too, but go on. Would you like to comment on that too? And then, Safina. Exactly. 
Safina, why don't you go ahead and then make, you know, put forward your comment and I've had these, uh, this draconian 10 minute sign has been held up for me. And I don't want to shortchange the audience, I'd like a couple of questions at least to be directed towards you guys um, and towards the UK. So just go ahead and speak. So and I was just going to say that um, I, um, some, some what Sarvat said, you know, pretty much the same thing that I was going to say. Um, the natural progression is supposed to happen. I mean, things that we are experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, I feel every 10 to 15 years, experiences mm -hmm. and problems change. And we are the ones who are going to be talking about the problems we face now. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, maybe we, you know, pe the people writing were not facing the same problems. Secondly, the themes, like she said, you know, that um, we face, we feel, uh, for example, Little America, you know, it deals with a person who um, is looking for the idea of freedom, um, you know, from Pakistan. So that book is not to be sold in the West because they don't understand the concept of not having freedom. One of the most refreshing uh, things about that was most people write about Little Pakistan in America. Correct. This was the flip side. Um, you know, I found I that admirable. The progression mm. with younger writers is just the natural way and the natural course that should happen. Okay. Um, Great. Um, would, the, would anyone in the audience like to ask a question? Yes, could you uh, go ahead and stand up? I think you might end up being um, audible if you just, or they'll take a microphone to you. Please, Inko, make mic. Yeah. Well, he's, he's telling me very kindly that we have about 15 minutes for question Hello. answer. So, yeah, that's good. Well, my name is Nasir. Uh, I'm a Bajan writer myself. Uh, from the conversation of Mira, mm -hmm. I can just make it out that uh, there is no natural writing. It's all is, you know, you have to sort of uh, put a lot of effort, pain, and perseveration mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, write. So I think, uh, should we say that the natural writing is just a myth because whosoever I've me met in my life, is <laughs> the writer has always said it's always writing you know, painful writing. So the other question that I'll, I'll connect it is that, is there any concept of, uh, uh, you know, living through writing in Pakistan? Do you mean earning a living through writing? Yeah, because it's really scary to live like <laughs> one of your so books. So <laughs> well, I'm not met a writer who's, uh, who lives by writing, so that's why I just... <laughs> <laughs> 
to one use one. that horrible cliche, don't put your eggs in one basket. <laughs> uh, try to diversify. I tried I think what he wants to get at is how lucrative can this profession get, really? It depends. It not depends on how. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think very, it's a he, very. and he deserves a candid <laughs> answer, <laughs> <Not> everybody. <laughs> Keep your day job. <laughs> Keep your day job because you don't want to lose that. Uh, often what writers do, uh, Beta, is that they go ahead and have a job that's kind of affiliated with the writing, publishing, exactly. teaching, journalism. These are um, uh, areas where you'd find the most writers coming from. But occasionally you can have the rare banker getting up and going, I've had enough <laughs> of this, <laughs> or policeman, Omar <laughs> Shahid Ahmed, hello. Um, so I think that that's, uh, uh, that's something which is, uh, you know, pretty much um, logical. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, okay, let me go ahead and get the gentleman there and then the lady there and then, yeah. Hello. Mm. Yes, on the masculine assumption, <laughs> I have a question for our moderator, who said <laughs> initially that you hadn't found any male character <gasps> written by a woman who was convincing. Does no. Does that mean you haven't found King Lear or Hamlet convincing? I know my Shakespeare canon inside out, um, and the thing is that um, I uh, Shakespeare was male, no. and was and so I find no. No, you don't think so? You think he was a woman? <laughs> well, being what? Bing? Google? I, I, I'm not getting, I'm not. Uh, Google yeah. was Shakespeare a woman. Okay. The point is that Shakespeare <coughs> was a bit like Mozart in that he was genius, but the reason that I stated what I did was uh, is because um, I think that masculinity um, uh, has a certain uh, very, very high level of um, aggression, of chauvinism, of, uh, they were originally men were hunters. Uh, if you get to the very heart of the matter, uh, and I'm talking about the uh, uh, ancestral, um, you know, uh, there's no arguing with biology. And I'm not saying that they are hunters now, but, but that's why it's not always, uh, it's really very, very difficult for a woman to access them authentically. That's my personal opinion. Um, there may be other reviewers and critics who feel that women have done a wonderful job of creating a male character. Um, Sorry. No, I'll look into this. Is she the one who's written something on the Iliad uh, where she's uh, gone ahead and written the Silence of the Girls or something or like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I read the Silence of the Girls and she's done a great job on that one. But I, I love the way she portrays masculinity in that. Hmm. Okay. Okay, That's I'll look into it. Um, uh, uh, yes, yes, that lady over there. Um, G. Hello. Uh, I have a question related to short story writing and, sorry, in general. So uh, often when I write my short stories, I usually plan an outline. There's this idea in my head which I jot down, and then when I get to writing the story halfway through, I feel like it's not matching, right? It's ha it has its own path. It's going its own way. So how do you navigate through that different, uh, the different way the short story might, you know, find its way, wriggle its way through? Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of create a balance? Or like, what's your... Yeah, it's a really good question. Just a ton of rewriting, and you have to be okay with the idea of rewriting because that's how you discover the thoughts that were lurking somewhere in your head. And I'm a very, um, I write strong characters. I'm a more of a character person. I'm not hugely plot driven. Um, I think character distilled actually becomes plot. So you have to take mm. your cues from your characters. If your characters are going somewhere you don't want them to go, just follow them for a while. This sounds very airy fairy, but hota aise hi hai. You have to follow them for a while and then they'll tell you that this is sort of how they're feeling about a certain situation. And I completely agree with you. The outlines are just a scaffolding, as Sar Sarvath was saying earlier. And then there's a lot of chaos and eventually you will emerge at a clearing, but you just have to keep rewriting and, and trust that you'll get somewhere. There is no method to at least my madness. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, over there. Hello. Uh, so I wanted to ask as to why do South Asian writers and Pakistani writers feel the need to appeal to the West? 
as Meera stated that we need to, you know, portray a picture that we see. But why do we feel the need to portray this picture to the West? Because, you know, a lot mm. of Pakistani writers tend to take things that are very uh, basic and everyday for us and then they mm. romanticize it in a way that appeals to the West. So how do uh, young budding writers overcome yeah, that's an this? Question. Yes, Meera will address that. Aapka naam kya hai? Uh, dua. Dua, thank you for asking that. And I actually wanted, I had so much to say, but I know that we were short on time. I just wanted to share something that happened with me while I was writing this book. Um, you know, I was describing uh, gulab jamans, and I didn't want to say what they were. And my editor Googled gulab jamun, and she wrote, Likhavatha, the character reached for some gulab jamans, and then she wrote, comma, deep fried milk curd. And I thought to myself, <laughs> Main, how will I ever show my face to my Pakistani readers? <laughs> Nobody ever says. And then Mira reached for the donut, comma, a ring-shaped deep-fried <laughs> dessert, right? We don't say that because Great. we have been imbibing and uh, consuming Western culture because there's an asymmetry of power there. So these are very, very good questions which we should be asking. And just to sort of t take it all the way back to your original question, which was, where, what is the future of Pakistani fiction? slightly to play the devil's advocate, even though I'm on this panel, what is the purpose that Pakistani fiction in English is serving? We are competing with Netflix, whether we like it or not. I was sick the last six days, and all I did was watch really, excuse my language, shitty shows on Netflix. <laughs> did I read a book? I didn't. The, the pace, the speed at which you get information, you don't actually have to do any work, it's just given to you, that is what we are up against. And, and as much as I'm very proud of the work I do, but mehnat bhi hoti hai, badi pain hai, as everybody yeah. said today, we are, we are up against television. We are living in the golden age of television. So we shouldn't kid ourselves about, about sort of uh, how important our work is, because ultimately, I don't know how many takers there are for, for the kind of work we do. <laughs> I see Victoria Schofield in the audience. Would she, would she like to make a comment in general on the panel? Uh, we'd be really honored. She was our uh, keynote speaker yesterday. Thank you so much. Well, I was dreading to make a comment, but <laughs> as a British person here, I mean, there's, there's one point I w would like to make, um, is that we all feel, in terms of our remuneration, mm. I think it's a common strand among us all for love, not money. And uh, we love writing, whether mm -hmm. we're writing fiction, whether we're not writing fiction. And I, I get asked that many times, you know, can you possibly make a living? And as you said, uh, you make other ways of making sure that you can continue writing. And I do remember listening to Khalid Hosseini um, when he wrote The Kite Runner. Mm -hmm. And he was, as we know, a doctor. And his mother was terribly proud of him being a doctor in the United States. And in order to write The Kite Runner, he had to get up at like four in the morning to find the time to write because then he had to go and do his doctoring. And uh, he made this funny, very funny remark. He said, uh, I used to long to wake up at four in the morning. Mm. And then he was <laughs> looking at himself thinking, well, you know, I must be absolutely crazy. But then, of course, it was the curve. He did so well that he gave up his doctoring, much to his mother's <laughs> distress, <laughs> and became a professional writer. And so... I think it, it requires, I was listening to Hanif Qureshi earlier, it requires courage in so many manners if you oh. want to uh -huh. write. The other comment I would like to make is that lines do blur, and I don't think we should be writing for a particular market. Mm -hmm. To me, as a British person, one of the most marvelous things has been the Pakistani writers coming, coming out that I can read and understand the culture. I absolutely love that bit about having to define the... Gulab Jam. Um, <laughs> I've had that in other words. But for example, I was one of the early writers on Kashmir in nonfiction, and then suddenly Kashmiri novelists came up, uh, Bashar al-Khir, Mirza Wahid, and others. Uh, they, they were not writing because they only felt they could have a particular market. They were writing for a bigger market. So I wouldn't like to think that we're going to box ourselves into just simply writing for a few people or a, or, or a certain to feel that we can we can write for all of us and you know where your words will fall and who you'll inspire I mean think about Babsi Sidwa with her omnibus book a fantastic book for British people to understand the effects of partition on on South Asians mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much Ms. Gofield and could I have a round of applause for Sarvat and 
those sitting here. We have You've made this panel a great success. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. And thank you, panelists. Thank you. <laughs> thank that you went by very fast. Thank you. Take care, Sarva. Thanks so much for joining us.